So welcome to The Shape of Dialogue. Today I'm joined by Professor Paul Kilmartin from the University of Auckland. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. For Thanks, Michael, and real pleasure to be here today uh, to join with you. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're going to talk on this continuing conversation that I'm having on the podcast about the relationship between science and mataranga Māori, which is can be translated to traditional Māori knowledge. But maybe we can start with your definition of what mataranga Māori is, and then we can move on to your thinking on the whole matter between the relationship between those two areas. Okay, I think that's a really important uh, point to, or, or starting point. Uh, I, I don't have a specific definition as such, but I'm aware of the, the different ways in which Mataranga Māori can be understood. And I think a key thing is it's very broad and includes so many aspects of the Māori way of life, right from knowledge, uh, things that they've learned that we would class as scientific, uh, and, and right through to, to different customs and, and so forth. Another aspect of this is is when is that is that body of Mataranga Māori uh, uh, to be defined, and I think Charles Royal has done a great job in, in in describing different phases in our history, the classical phase, which which we may be trying to pull back to now, pre-European, and what was the understanding then, the world view of Māori and their customs. But as Charles points out, that changed so much during the early stages of colonisation. Very, uh, there was uh, a big input of religious views into Mataranga Māori. And, and we're coming now to, to what he describes as, as a postmodern economic approach to Mataranga Māori with so many more modern interests and ideas coming back and with the renewal of Māori language and uh, land and so forth that it's changing again. So it's a very dynamic uh, body of, 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 of ideas and, and ways and customs and uh, yeah, much much different then I would suggest than, than a specific body of knowledge like science, which is more of a process as some of your other people have pointed out. But I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's very hard to pin it down to exactly one or two specific things. Right, thank you. That's actually a very interesting description of it. I haven't heard it been put in that way so far, so that's good. Um, you're obviously a scientist. Can you tell us a bit about you know, what you do, where you've come from, your journey to where you are now? Uh, so, yeah, go, yeah, go right very ahead. happy to do so. And I've got quite a few different life strands, some of which are more relevant than others to this discussion. The fact that I can see you sitting in front of a piano, I'd, I'd have to uh, tell you that my first year at university involved doing performance piano uh, at Victoria oh, University, right. which is not particularly <laughs> relevant to today's subject. But um, uh, my main academic background has been in chemistry, though I've done a lot of art subjects and philosophy and theology as well. Uh, and uh, that's carried me through uh, getting a PhD at Auckland University to be now on the academic staff for the last 24 years. So within chemistry, I do I do electrochemistry, I do a lot of other wine chemistry, so I work closely with the wine industry, including the Goldwater family, uh, uh, and, and Goldie Wines is where we now run our postgraduate program, so I could talk about that all day as well, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. But I'd enter into that as a, a very keen interest I've had always in genealogy, and uh, I do have, uh, I am of Maori descent uh, from Naitahu, the South Island tribe, uh, and uh, I've done, done a lot of reading about their uh, life and, and history. Uh, I don't regard myself as Maori myself. I haven't been brought up in a marae and under those circumstances, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in particularly Naitahu issues and in genealogy, my own family history. Right. So, I mean, you obviously have a very broad uh, palette in your, in your epistemology. Uh, very interesting. Just just as an aside, I'm quite interested. You said you studied theology uh, from a religious um, position or just out of interest? No, no. I, I, I uh, Again, this is a, a wine connection as well, but if you know the Mission Estate is our, one of our yeah. prominent wineries in the Hawke's Bay. Well, up until 1990, that was that was a Catholic uh, seminary for the Marist Order who, who run teaching, uh, traditionally uh, ran a lot of the schools uh, in New Zealand, uh, particularly uh, in, in Wellington and Christchurch. So I went right through, I studied to be a priest and was ordained. So I went right through the seminary in the Hawke's Bay at the Mission Estate and I taught for a couple of years uh, at St. Bede's College in Christchurch. So I was teaching uh, maths, chemistry and, and religious studies. So I, I'm very aware of what it's like to uh, have a seminary education where 
those belief systems are being lived on a daily basis. You're learning about them and then teaching uh, religious studies alongside chemistry uh, at the high school level. So I do have high school experience as well. Wow, well, well, you, you're the perfect guest <laughs> for the subject, if I may say so. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's very interesting because I think um, delineating where that transition from the concrete to the ethereal, uh, for want of a better word, uh, is an interesting point, and I think that's part mm, of this mm. discussion. Uh, so what are your thoughts on um, this whole, you know, I, I actually always hate this word, but so-called controversy um, regarding the what was said by the seven, what I call the seven heretical professors who wrote a letter in defense of science, where they stated that Mataranga Māori fell short of being what could be called science. Uh, they, um, the response to them was uh, a tsunami of um, what I would call mostly hurt feelings, a little bit of ad hominem and a lot of uh, straw man uh, assessments of what they said. Um, so anyway, let, let me, yeah, what, what's your thoughts on the whole matter? Yeah. Well, it certainly brought, brought brought the whole issues to, to to the wider attention, and the reason I've, I've I've had a look at the issues since that uh, that that time in July last year is very much because of the listener uh, letter and its controversy, and a lot of which was was unhelpful in what followed. That and it's created a an environment where we've had little opportunity for dialogue. And uh, in fact, your podcast is, 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 is a, one of the few opportunities I think there are at the moment to actually have a conversation and uh, have those views out. So I hope it does get widely can listened I, to within New Zealand. <laughs> can I just butt in there? Um, mm. It's interesting you say that. Um, I think one of, the may, one of the reasons may well be that it's just too dangerous to talk about. Uh, I was told in no uncertain terms by a number of people um, that I shouldn't be having this conversation, which, and, and some of them are very, very smart, knowledgeable people. Others were just concerned about my own welfare. Um, so I just, which, which, you know, for me, that's a red rag to a ball. Um, if someone says you can't talk about it, I'll talk about it. But I think it's, you know, one of my guests, um, Kyle Gibson, put it perfectly. He said, it's his main concern was for the discourse itself mm. and it's, it's worrying for a society when uh, you can't have a, a rational discussion right especially about something as rational as science yes yes, yes. look anyway, i fully I'm endorse sure. those views and that was why yeah at the beginning of the year when i saw so little discourse happening i thought well we're in the chemistry department, um, Institute of Chemistry are people that uh, should be discussing this as it applies to that one particular subject, because there have been some changes made to how chemistry is being taught in the draft NCA syllabus. And uh, that should be debated amongst chemists if it's going into that syllabus. So in light of that, I, I did decide to have a uh, put on a seminar within our department, invited Institute of Chemistry and other people to uh, listen to my views, but I made the claim at the beginning there'd be something in my talk that everyone could disagree with, and I wanted uh, then, therefore, also to have discussion afterwards because I'm in the position I'm still learning about many of the issues, and I, I, I reserve the right to change my mind even tomorrow uh, based on what we talk about today, and that's the way the spirit I think it should be in. We're all still learning, uh, and uh, you know, we should be all be able to contribute to this without any of those fears uh, that, that you've, you've, you've elucidated. So we're starting to see, I think, uh, some recognition that some of that reaction was unhelpful. And that's the term actually was used last Friday by the uh, Brent Clothier in putting out a statement. I don't know if you've seen it from the Royal Society, no. acknowledging okay, that, that their response to it was unhelpful, both in the uh, what it did to the conversation and the fact that they, they, they got some things wrong about what the uh, listener letter had said. So that's right. worth having a look at. Uh, just came out late well, just, Friday night. Just, yeah, just on, for the audience, just um, elaborate on that. So, what what did they actually say they got wrong? Okay, Michael. Just 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 to uh, indicate what was uh, said from the Royal Society. As I say, they've used the term unhelpful uh, in regards to their response last year. And uh, specific points, they say that the society regrets that its response to the listener contributed to this unhelpful environment. 
including by stating that the authors of the listener suggested that Mataronga Māori is not a valid truth, whereas the listener letter included no such statement. The society also acknowledges that its reference to an outdated mode, outmoded definition of science outlined in the listener was based on the society's own interpretation of the listener's sentiments and that the listener letter did not outline any definition of science. So for those reasons, they've said that, that they've put out the statement to say, acknowledging some unhelpfulness of, of, their, of their statement at the time. So I think people are reflecting on, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of my colleagues say they thought the, the reaction to the letter was over the top and it's created this atmosphere where dialogue is different, but, it, but, it, but it's what we need, particularly as we're, not only the schools, but also the universities are going through uh, uh, re-evaluations of their curriculum. At University of Auckland, we call it the curriculum transformation. So we're looking at how we'll embed the best of Mataranga Māori within our courses and uh, uh, do our best to, to uh, address the issues, uh, the, the obligations of the treaty. But as this, as this develops, we're going to have to be careful and, and uh, sensitive about how uh, this is done. Uh, one colleague has, has uh, indicated that we need to respect Mataranga Māori and also the mana of each of the subjects, and mana meaning the dignity or the integrity of those subjects. And I think that's the right way to go. Uh, we see what is appropriate to put into uh, the various disciplines and subjects at the university and what gets uh, shown to be part of a historical uh, worldview of, of Māori, but which, which uh, we don't necessarily include, say, within a, a subject like chemistry. Right. I just want to backtrack for a second. I mm. want to acknowledge um, the Royal Society for coming out and saying what they, they're saying. They're saying. Um, you know, I think it's really important, even if you disagree with what someone has done, to when they come back and change their minds, I think it's really, really important to, to acknowledge that and, and take it in, in good faith. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I was very unimpressed by them initially, but I'm going to say I'm very impressed. It's a good sign that you're getting, getting yeah. this, this uh, addressed publicly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, now, I'm not a member of the Royal Society, so I don't know. I know there's been a lot of discussion happened this year. There was 70 or so of their fellows wanted a special meeting on the subject. So I think it's yeah. reflecting their concerns, uh, which I don't know any details about. Yeah. And just again, for a bit of background for the audience who, if they're new to this whole subject, what happened was that the seven heretical professors wrote a letter. Three of them were fellows of the society. The society received um, a number of anonymous complaints and the society started investigating whether there was a breach of ethical conduct uh, by the three fellows who were authors of the letter. So anyway, so and and that that has all been abandoned, uh, thankfully. Um, so, you know, I think reason is is slowly winning winning the day. So let's talk about you know you've mentioned the curriculum the new zealand curriculum a number of times so you're talking about which part which part of the curriculum and what level so we, in new zealand we sort of roughly divide it between primary school and secondary school sort of from up to the age of 12 and after the age of 13. yes yeah, so so the particular when i gave my seminar the particular uh development in the ncea curriculum uh, for secondary school students is, is at level one NCA, which I think may be your third to last year at, at high school. Uh, and uh, it, it was in a general science subject, but they have some, some big ideas that are put in for each of the leading uh, areas uh, that will be covered in that course. And one of them had, had, had brought in a concept from Mataranga Māori into uh, the big idea for chemistry. And I can read that idea out. Uh, and it's the one which formed the basis of discussions we had. So the concept here that's being introduced is Māori. Now, that's spelled M-A-U-R-I, and it means the life force or, or vital essence of something. And uh, I can go on, it has, has had a lot of other meanings and explanations, but that's the key aspect. So it's a different word for Māori, for the Māori people. I, and I'm not good enough at pronunciation that you'd clearly distinguish between Māori and Maori, but um, uh, it, it is this life force principle that, that is introduced in, in the chemistry. So I'll read out the way that this big idea is now uh, being, being uh, designated. 
So Māori is present in all matter. All particles have their own Māori and presence as part of a larger whole, for example, within a molecule, polymer, salt or metal. And it goes on to say when a substance is burnt or dissolved, the particles remain with their own Māori. Now this, this uh, of course, relates to a significant chemical principles. The atoms that are part of uh, molecules do remain and uh, carbons and oxygens and hydrogens and so forth persist as they undergo all sorts of chemical transformations to become part of new molecules. So they, they are fixed and unchanging, apart of course from nuclear reactions where they may have been formed or maybe uh, gradually degrading and uh, through uh, slow nuclear reactions. So apart from that, at the chemical level, they are consistent. And, and I think that's what that big idea is getting at. But it's brought in this, this other concept that there is a, a Māori, a life force present in all matter. And that's part of a, a very much the, the world view and beliefs uh, within Mataranga Māori, that not only living things, but uh, uh, what we'd call inanimate objects also possess this Māori. And that's something that where I think the science and, and, and this belief system uh, would struggle to meet. And I'd suggest that chemistry has come across this concept uh, several times already in overseas examples, and it hasn't found a life force within rocks uh, that we would then feel comfortable about putting into uh, our chemistry syllabus. I'm saying this all in the context that science is always able to go and undergo revision. If we find something that's new and can be proven, we'll include it in the syllabuses of chemistry worldwide. But uh, there can't just be a chemistry for New Zealand based on, on, on the beliefs uh, that, that came from our Indigenous people, I have to say. Yeah, so just to reiterate that, all scientific knowledge is provisional. And, and so science is a process of uh, sort of leapfrogging, um, sometimes abandoning, uh, uh, you know, a particular knowledge and paradigm shifts. But um, as Lawrence Krauss states a number of times, Lawrence Krauss is, is a renowned uh, American physicist who was on my last podcast. He states a number of times science actually doesn't necessarily abandon what um, has gone before. It's just incorporated into a bigger system. I think that's right. And I believe, in fact, that the majority of what we know now, saying chemistry, will, will, will remain. It's not going to all be overturned. But we may yeah. understand the underlying, you know, what really is an atom or, or some of the underlying forces creating these. We, we may improve and, and undergo new yeah. big perspectives. But a lot of the detail which scientists, chemists are doing every day are, are part of a, what will be a body of uh, information that will last. Yeah. So as a scientist, you would not um, categori categorically rule out that there is such a thing as Ma Ma I, sorry, I'm going to butcher it. Māori? Māori? Māori. It's Māori. That's yes, right. Sorry. Yes, it's quite a hard, yes, word. Yes, quite yes. hard word to distinguish from, from the actual name Māori. Um, and if, you know, if tomorrow uh, there was a discovery uh, that was reliable, replicatable, um, and shown to be provenly correct, it would be incorporated into the science, scientific literature. And that, you know, philosophically, that is the beauty of science. It is not mm. fixed. Um, I say science is a vector. It, it's, it's always moving. It's in, a, in, you know, it's actually multiple vectors. It's always moving in, in multiple directions. So as a 15-year-old, is this being... Is this, am I, you know, like next year or this year, am I going to have to answer a, um, a, an exam question and for my NCA exams about Māori? If, if the syllabus remains as, as it's been drafted, I, I believe that this syllabus this year is being, say, trialled in, in four or five schools. And right, there'll okay. be bigger trials next year and it'll be the year after where it would come in across the board. So right. um, I'd be interested to see if, 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 because I think there's been some mixed reactions, even last year from teachers and, and, and how they teach this. And the feedback, as I say, uh, it would be interesting to see if, if it will remain uh, in two years' time and be taught to everyone. And you've got a good question then. What, yeah, will there be, how do you examine it if there are different yeah. views on, 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 on the place of this uh, concept? Yeah, well, I mean, the... Original 
the report where all this stems from, which I'll include in the show notes, which is what the seven heretical professors were countering in their in defense of science letter, uh, was so vague in its wording. Um, I, you know, I, I had no idea what was going to be instantiated in, in the curriculum. So it's really, uh, I wouldn't say it's good to hear what you've told me, but it's 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 nice. To, well, it's interesting to know that uh, my concerns haven't been uh, wasted. So, as uh, this is a question to me, um, what they're proposing is putting non-scientific material in the scientific classroom. Is that correct? I think I think this is a concrete example where that, that is happening. I think they've got it wrong in this example. Uh, having said that, I'd like to, I think there are other ways to think about the term Maori, which could be actually quite useful because another definition is the life supporting capacity, uh, which could be say applied to a river. And we, we, we have this used a little bit on, on the media you'll see from time to time, that after there has been an oil spill or pollution of, of a river, they'll say they want to do things to, to improve the mori or return the mori, meaning the life sustaining capacity, the fact that life can grow, fish can grow in that river or the, the river can be safe for humans to, 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 to swim in or drink. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, 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 that's very similar to the way we would say that the river is healthy. So we're using an analogy to human health to say that that river can support life. And, and there's plenty of research examples overseas talking about the health of waters and rivers uh, that, w that we can find. So I think this, if, if we, you defined or understood Maori and Maori in that way, I think uh, you could, and, and Dan Hikoria, who you've had on your program, is one who advocates exactly that, that definition. And uh, that, 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 that's a useful way to go. That's different though from saying there's, there's a life force in, in, in inanimate matter or in individual atoms and molecules. I think that's very yes. a very different concept. Yes, well, I'm very big on definitions because without definitions, mm -hmm. we, we it's very difficult to talk about things um, without clear definitions. What concerns me is when definitions change from domain to domain mm -hmm. for, you know, whatever reasons. Um, so what... Um, you know, so what you've just told me about this, the um, life force of a river, to me, that's just semantics. You know, we can call it Māori or we can talk about, talk about life force and we can, you know, easily package. It's like a bag which you package a whole lot of things into, which are going to um, measure the health of the river, for example. Hmm. But from going back to that example that you uh, pointed out before about the you know, the use of Māori in the chemistry classroom. That, to me, is a much broader definition. Right. And again, that is specifically non-science, scientific. And again, going back to um, the use of the word of Māori in reference to the well-being of a river, why don't we, why, is, is that ever clearly stated, you know? Is it saying, because there obviously has to be some translation between the two languages, and they have to be uh, relatively static. Obviously, language is always, is always changing, but when you're speaking language, it generally is static. Um, so, yeah, w what are your comments on that? Yeah, well, uh, when it's been used in, in reference to rivers and studies of, of, of pollution of, of waters, uh, it is usually f uh, defined in that way. I'm aware that this is a term which in, in, in the Maori language uh, is, is like many, many words uh, there that uh, have a real depth to them and multiple meanings. And it's often in the particular context uh, that the exact uh, usage is, is defined. And it's not easy, always easy, easy to translate because in different circumstances, it can be used in slightly different ways. So I'm respectful of that. Uh, but uh, uh, as I say, I think there's a particular way to define it that can be useful. Uh, to include in science classrooms and in our wider discussions. There are so many Māori words like mana that are being brought in every day, and, 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 and I enjoy that. Uh, and uh, it's uh, well, inclusive. It's part of, part yeah. of our... Uh, well, yeah. well, it's just the dynamic between mm. um, uh, cultures. I mean, you know, to take for the example the English language, uh, even pre, you know, before coming to New Zealand, it, it's it's just a mongrel. Most languages are mongrels, and um, I always think mongrels mongrels are the best because they incorporate the best of of so many 
uh, diverse, you know, mediums. So that yeah, that's just yeah. part of the cultural development of, of New Zealand and being a New Zealander. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to me, you know, I just want to just focus on this, um, you know, concept of the life force, regardless of whether something's inanimate. So essentially, what they're saying this, this is the question. They're saying. Um, that life force is on atomic and subatomic uh, level, because because you you and I are yeah you and I are alive, um, but the computers we're staring at are not alive, but but they're all made of the, the they're all made of stardust. They're all made of the same thing in terms of atoms. I mean, Richard Feynman said, you know, um, everything is is atoms. So. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, look, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, having said that, we're still trying to really understand what an atom is. We've got models of it that are like planets with electrons moving around, and others are like waves. Electrons are like waves. So, so we have real, real trouble describing what an atom is as our instruments probe atoms in different ways. But, uh, uh, yeah, the life force principle, whether uh, all matter is directed towards. Uh, creating life is, is I mean, this has been debated for, 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 for a long time. And I see some of the discussions which, uh, uh, as I say, people writing 40, 50 years ago, particularly people who Charles Royal have advocated, particularly his mentor, Maori Sorry. Marsden, if I... Can I just, yep. can I just um, stop you? Can you hmm. tell the audience who uh, Charles Royal is? So a very important person in, in this whole area, because uh, amongst his different roles. I hope you might get him on one day. He's uh, been responsible for developing uh, Maturanga Māori learning and training centres. Uh, there are individual institutions in New Zealand where, where you can have a degree in learning now in Maturanga Māori, and he's been uh, an advocate and teacher in those. Uh, he's also had an important role uh, within the uh, uh, funding system. The, the, uh, the government funding agencies developed a, a principle called Vision Maturanga, and when we put in all our applications now, we have to consider how, how, how our research will benefit Māori, whether we should be engaging with uh, different Māori groups uh, because of the nature of the research. And he, he was largely responsible for drafting a, a, uh, those principles. So I think he's got a, a very good overview, very balanced view, and has written a book which I think everyone should read in 2009 called Mataranga Māori an Introduction. And that's some of the... Uh, insights I alluded to earlier about the different phases in which uh, Mataranga Māori has gone through, seen as a dynamic system which is continuing to, to, to evolve. And uh, the thing about people well versed in it, they can create new knowledge and understanding. It's, it's not reverting to a ways, uh, you know, a worldview that was right 300 years ago. And even back then it was, it was a dynamic uh, changing uh, situation. So the real experts were able to look at new phenomenon and and develop Maturanga Māori. So as I say, very insightful in his roles in that. I was just about to refer to one of his mentors was the Reverend Māori Marsden, uh, who wrote about uh, a lot of these issues and, and uh, Charles has edited some of his works. And uh, my point about there, he, he, here is somebody who was also a, a minister and you see the concept of Māori and many other things being really developed the way that people like Talaha de Chardin, uh, the uh, Jesuit uh, paleontologist who talked a lot about uh, how matter was orientated towards creating uh, ultimately life and ultimately uh, a new sphere with an omega point. These are terms out of uh, his, his writings, which are in Māori Marsden's own writings. So you see what, there... What? In it, now, do you, yeah, are what, you familiar with those two uh, concepts? Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, just what era are we talking about? So, so Telly so they... was writing around the 1950s. Some of his publications right. came out after his death, actually. Uh, but he was uh, involved in the 1930s, 40s, mm. uh, and, and had developed ideas about uh, viewing the world as, as, as a global living system and how evolution had drawn... Uh, us towards that point. So he was in close contact with people like Verdansky, uh, the, uh, uh, from, from the Soviet system, who had a, a geologist who had uh, shared some ideas but had a different worldview, you'd have to say, about 
how they fit it together. But the concept of a new sphere, where the thinking envelope of of the uh, of the planet is developing on top of the biosphere. So the biosphere was a term that came even from the 19th century. And these authors had written a lot about that and were trying to project forward in some cases to this omega point where, where knowledge would, would, would grow beyond its current, uh, current status. And uh, yeah, Maori Marsden is very much uh, puts out those, those ideas. So I've, I'd like to, uh, Charles to comment at some stage whether he, he was influenced by such writings. But you can see there Mataranga Maori developing in a dynamic way, picking up other philosophical ideas and, and merging them with what had come from the past in New Zealand. Uh, even though perhaps most scientists wouldn't wouldn't go down that pathway now with those ideas, but you can see how that dynamic has has happened in those cases. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm actually keen to to go down that rabbit hole, but I, I think that's probably a, a podcast for another day. Um, one thing, you know, again going back to this a concept of a, a life force, is it? Would you describe it as a spiritual life force? Is that correct? Well, it's a, another way it's defined is that the, the Māori, M-A-U-R-I, is the binding force between the physical and the spiritual. So that within people we have the, the wairua, the wairua, the spirit, and the physical nature, and, and Māori is holding it all together. So in the very early understandings of disease is that when uh, uh, people uh, offended uh, the Atua, the gods, the family gods, that one of the uh, results of that would be that the Maori would be affected, they would get sick. And even the Tohonga had the ability to, through, through, through the right uh, prayers, cast in a negative way, to actually remove the Maori from that person, and the person would die because the connection between the physical and spiritual had been broken. So you've got all of that concept about what Maori is as well, if you go back uh, into the earlier writings. And Maori Marsden would, would has outlined those as well in his works. Right. Um, to my ears, that sound all sounds very religious. It's 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 a part of a, I would say part of a belief system. Uh, yes. So and, and and it made sense. It's a, it made sense of the world at the time. It's part of a worldview. And uh, great, we we can learn about yes. it. And but but it is it should remain as a belief system when when you come up against consider what goes into a science curriculum yeah and also when when i was listening to it, it sort of resonates with you know what happened in the pre pre-scientific era in um in western countries and you know anywhere really um but specifically western western uh, uh, europe um you know people who burned at the stake or you know witches were drowned because they were considered to have evil spirits and all sorts of um, nefarious activities that we don't do that anymore um and it's in all our ancestry it's on them but it's on yeah it's on your uh, yeah, you go back to europe right, go yeah. direct to any culture far yeah. enough back we have that we, we seem to have that yeah sure. i mean i'm going to make a shocking statement we're all human mm. um and, um so what you know, what i find interesting is not so much the differences in how, dif how different cultures think it's, it's actually the similarities and how yeah, yeah. you know they come up you know sure zeus may be hurling thunderbolts but um you know at the same time maori maui the god is pulling up a, a the north island ge geological structure from his canoe so it's it's you know a lot to do with the propensity to try and make find explanations and again touching back to science it we we can now find explanations which are provable across time and culture and i would um posit that what you were talking about then about those belief systems is that they are belief systems their their um their claims their non-scientific claims and they're unfalsifiable what are your thoughts on that? Accepted. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the uh, discussions at present where, uh, if I may make this comment, that we, we're talking about Mataranga Māori so often as, as, as a valid knowledge system uh, and then co-equal with, with other knowledge systems, which 
for a start, it doesn't make sense of what I do in chemistry or science. I don't sort of see that as a worldview or knowledge system necessarily. There's very many religious people I work with uh, yeah. who, who uh, undertake chemistry, but it's not part, it's, it doesn't really define their worldview so well. But um, uh, it's, 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 um, we're not seeing the word belief put in there. The way that perhaps we did 20 years ago when these discussions were had, and why I say 20 years ago is uh, if I go to some of our Naitahu leaders and uh, a very good book was put together by a group of authors led by Te Marai Tao from Naitahu about treaty-based guidelines and protocols for tertiary institutions was the name of that, very much applying it to South Island links between tribes and and uh, and the universities. And, and there it was quite clear that they said they, and I'm quoting, we accept that this knowledge must now be regarded as a belief system that fulfills cultural and spiritual needs. So they saw that uh, Naitahu for the South Island needed to be the, the guardian of that and define what went into it. But the university would have a very different role. Uh, it would be one of uh, rational criticism of, of any knowledge which was going to be brought from uh, Maturanga Māori more generally into, into, into the university curriculum. So it's acknowledging that there is good science, there is science, there is knowledge within Maturanga Māori, but there's also a lot of belief systems which uh, need to be put and uh, treated differently. So I think this, 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 this was being talked about in a different way 20 years ago, I think, than some of the current uh, discussions or, or uh, uh, the way it's been brought into the school curriculum. We have this principle from the government, if I quote it in, in Māori first, uh, mana orite mo te mataranga Māori, equal status for mataranga Māori with well, with what is the question, uh, with other bodies of knowledge. Again, you're, you're trying to treat them as being equal, then they must be the same kind of thing. But I think Mataranga Māori is, is, is bigger, uh, in a sense, than any specific subject and includes all those worldviews that are, are not. So, so uh, again, the listener letters, letters saying that Mataranga Māori or Indigenous knowledge is, is the way they said it, and, and science are different. It's, uh, it's a bit because they're... they're, they're comparing apples and orange to some extent. The one thing I wish the, the letter writers perhaps had said at the end was to say that there is there is science amongst Mataranga Māori, and, and I think they've seen that later, but it didn't come through. But as I say, it's, well, it's, I think, it's broader yeah. than just uh, than, than, than that. Yeah, I think they touched on it. They, I think, mm. you know, I'm sure they probably, um, you know, would like to have instantiated it a bit more strongly mm. now, but I think they said off, off the top of my head it was something like um, Maori knowledge could contribute to science. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it was Which, there. It was there. Yes, yeah. yes, and, yes. And what, what I've, you know, I mean, I've this whole um, discussion has been, in, you know, bringing in world leading scientists like Stephen Pinker, Jerry Coyne, John Drew McFadden, uh, Lawrence Krauss into the discussion. And what's interesting is they acknowledge that Maori knowledge is scientific, you know, yes, well, particular yes. aspects of aspects, it. Aspects, um, yes, you yes. Know, you know, just from the last podcast, Lawrence Krauss says, you know, how you grow a particular crop and all those sorts of things. So where it's practical knowledge in, is, to use a um, Jerry Coyne's term, science broadly construed, where we're using, you know, us humans are using rationality to... to uh, to stay alive and get ahead in, in, in this uh, very, very difficult universe that we yeah, seem to be yeah. living. Um, Can I use that so, as, as a kickoff yeah. point for another, just another thing I'd yeah. like to just, just mention, because um, as as part of that, one of the reasons I did a, did a, did so, a seminar. Sorry, sorry can, I, can I just, yep, yep, before yep. you do that, because yep. I just want to acknowledge something I think is important. So um, the Naitahu uh, uh, experts that you were talking about before 20 years ago what you said to me there was a, a, a parallel or an agreement with what the seven heretical professors are saying that's the report there right. I think you'd find it's it was at the time and it still is it has a lot of challenges uh, to, yeah. to give proper uh, role and and respect to Maori and Naitau in the South Island, but it was it was yeah. it was not too different from some of the some of the right. uh, perspectives being being said in that letter. I'd, I'd suggest, yeah. Yeah, and then um, as far as I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Charles Royal, who you mentioned earlier, he he stated that Mataranga Maori is not science. Is that correct? 
Um, I'm not sure you'd put it like that. I, I, th I think he's uh, um, w would say it includes and encompasses a huge number of different types of knowledge. So uh, yeah. it's a very inclusive term. Here, here it includes gardening, fishing, house building, warfare, musical instruments, tacit knowledge, yeah. implied knowledge, scientific knowledge, religious knowledge. It reveals, yeah, and so forth. So he's, he's, he's very aware that it's 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 the total picture of, of Maori culture and values, and uh, values are in there, uh, as well as uh, the knowledge, scientific knowledge as well, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, it is, you know, for what I've learned um, in, this, in this whole process is that certain aspects of that system are, you know, science broadly construed. Mm, mm. But the, we have to be very cognizant that there is spiritual you know there's a strong spiritual belief system in, yes, in yes, yes 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 and, and just before i let you go down what you're Another about, path. Talk about <laughs> yeah, yeah. um no no, no um, i just want to talk about respect because you've, mm. you've used that word now i'm um you know as i said i've been told by a number of times by a number of people that this is a very dangerous t topic to talk about for me to talk about because and they didn't they didn't elaborate but um i can extrapolate that it may sound if if i say let's say i i, I pose a devil's advocate advocate mm -hmm. question and say xyz uh, part of mataranga maori is non-scientific that could be that could be easily construed by some as being incredibly disrespectful to maori knowledge um, my position is I um, I didn't think the word respect when when talking about ideas I didn't think the re word respect is that useful either ideas are, are, are correct or they're incorrect or they're a bit of a combination of mm, the two mm. um, and if someone wants to like be in terms of spirituality if someone wants to be Islamic or Christian or Jewish or um believe certain things i mean i was recently speaking to uh a, a, a maori friend who was telling me his belief systems about where the body goes after mm. they die and you know it's, it's it's what i would call a myth now i respect his right to to hold that um and i respect him as an individual but it's not something i i agree with and i wouldn't I wouldn't uh, sign on to that myth myself, mm -hmm. but that and so I, I think this word respect is, um, is is redundant. I'm a humanist, so I respect all humans, um, and I respect everyone to hold their views, um, whatever they they are, whether they're right or wrong. But when it comes down to uh, what we should be teaching our children in the science classroom, it's not a matter of respect. It's a matter of provability. So again, going back to the, the concept of the life force, the Māori, um, if, it's, if it's provably correct, yes, we should be teaching it to our children. If it's provably incorrect um, or hasn't proven to be correct, I don't think we should. it should be deemed science and put in the scientific classroom. Mm. But in no way is that disrespectful to Māori in general or mataranga Māori uh, in uh, particular yes and and an example of showing respect to this very term uh one of the the way uh, occasions you'll most uh, likely hear it is going on to a marae and one of the local men will will will, will introduce himself and, and and the tribe and, and start with the phrase tihei maori ora and that's maori in the m-a-u-r-i the maori is is healthy amongst us we are we're we are vital we're energized uh, and I'm going to now speak to you about our, our values and our history before perhaps welcoming you as a people onto our marae. So, yeah, I understand that. I respect but, that. That's the right context yeah. in which to use that word. And it, it's, it's yeah. got a resonance. It, 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 it's a real depth to the meaning yeah. of the word when it's used in that context. Yeah. Yeah. And just as a personal aside, you know, I, I'd sign on to that. Mm. Um, to me, it's talking about this, you know, sort of a hard to define word, the, mm. the spirit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the spirit of but, the people um, is, is strong, is healthy. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, so I've got, you know, got that out of my system. So what, what, we, what were you 
going to start on? Well, I was leading from the point you made about how uh, there are examples and good examples of Maori science. Just to uh, link in uh, another reason why I uh, developed a a seminar on chemistry. So, uh, Sorry, I'm going to be really pedantic. I don't think there's anything as Maori science or Islamic science or this science. So there's science that may have been done by yes, Maori. And, and sorry, I mean, I'd need it in that, yeah. in that way, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was reading an article late last year in Stuff by Joan Druitt, a maritime historian, and she went through uh, what, what she found is, is, is impressive examples of the technology and, and, and knowledge of Maori in both uh, the, the navigation coming to the Pacific, one of the things which they were so great and advanced in, and also, which is of interest to me as a food and wine scientist, is... Um, the way that they grew crops in a very difficult, cool climate area like New Zealand. Now, I could talk about cool climate wines all day, but uh, it really took uh, great experience and testing to be able to get their food crops to grow, particularly down in the South Island. But at the end of that, she said how what was even more impressive, said while, um, while these people were very learned in these different spheres, they did not have chemistry, geology, physics or metallurgy. And I could accept, but it made me think, well, does that let chemistry off the hook? Uh, or, or are there some examples of, uh, of, 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 of chemistry being done? And so I think, in fact, you do find, particularly in, 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 in the creation of pigments, dyes, uh, the red and the black pigments for rock art and for what was uh, cosmetic and, and the red uh, pigments that went on, on a lot of the Mariah and other things, you do see some interesting chemistry there. And I say it's interesting because they, it's, it, you can make a comparison between oil-based and water-based paints. And the fact that uh, up till fairly recently, if you wanted a really durable paint, it needed to be oil-based. In fact, uh, the technology is now gone that we can practically use water-based paints everywhere. But uh, they would dissolve their dyes, be they inorganic rocks uh, that had the red pigments in or uh, soot that had been taken from certain trees, they would mix that with with oils from from shark or from birds to create a water-based, an uh, oil-based pigment that that would last for centuries. And it has done in in the uh, rock art caves of the South Island, close to where my home rise. So uh, that and and some other uh, the medicinal properties, uh, the medicinal uh, compounds that can be found in native plants, uh, are, 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 there are several examples which I think we can usefully bring into our curriculum, and they already are in some of the school curriculum as examples of, of dyes which are pH sensitive. They change colour as you change the acid base properties, so you can make a blue dye out of some of these materials as well. So I think that there is some interesting chemistry that can be found after all, and, and I think it's things like that which we can bring in more particularly into our curriculum. As well, there will be areas where we're, we're particularly finding important uh, biomedical properties of some native plants where we need to engage uh, with, with Māori as the indigenous knowledge holders. And this is fully consistent with the uh, De- Declaration of Human Rights, Indigenous Peoples from 2007, uh, where we acknowledge their, their role and in, in that knowledge. And, and, and if we learn from that, we partner with Māori. Uh, in doing so, and, and many of us are trying to do that more uh, in, in our research. So those are some very positive areas where I think we can have the right engagement, even in chemistry, which some people leave out as, as something that was that, that, that important to Māori, but I think there are some good good learning examples uh, there to be found. Right, yeah. Well, you know, we're all looking for paint that will last hundreds of years. So yes, <laughs> so yes, maybe yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe it's a good idea to bring that knowledge uh, um, to the fore. Yeah, you know, I think a, a lot of this, you know, this is my reading of it, and I'm not saying I'm right, but uh, it'd be interesting to get your take on it. You know, going back to the word respect, uh, you know, that we all acknowledge the tragedy uh, that occurred through the colonial era, um, you know, and uh, many would still argue that it's occurred today. Um, to the position of Māori in this country and to their knowledge systems and their respect. And I, you know, I welcome the renaissance of the Māori culture. Um, it's, it, it's not for me to, you know, upon an eye to welcome it, but I'm just from a personal perspective. Um, so I think that is really important. And I think, but in the, this whole discussion, we've got to separate what we want to teach 
you know, the hard facts that we want to teach to our children and respect for a culture, you know, um, righting the wrongs of the past. And, you know, what I what I think a lot of this is about is trying to right the wrongs in the past, but in the wrong way um, by, you know, as going back to this, you know, the concept of putting non-scientific things in the science classroom. Yes, 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 and I'm um, very much in agreement with you with you on that. Um, yeah, and yeah. and we're continuing to to look how this should be best done. <coughs> uh, as I say, just just at the moment, there's online you can read about the University of Auckland's curriculum transformation plans and bringing uh, improving our educational experience for our for our um, uh, students. And it's interesting there. If, if you, uh, I've been getting down into some of the detail because there's a key issue here is how uh, you embed Mataranga Māori across all the courses, and that's still being starting to be discussed. And it's I think we're taking a different approach from equal status of knowledge that went into high schools. I think it's a much more, well, I'll use the word conservative, but it's 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 going to be more gradual and cautious. Uh, and 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 if I quote uh, what what, and this is online for the university, where relevant and appropriate, provide opportunities and the ethical and sustainable implementation of Te Tiriti, the treaty principles, accountabilities, and Mataranga Māori. So you're saying we're relevant and appropriate and uh, ethical and sustainable implementation. So uh, I'd like them to unpack that a bit, the, the, the people who are putting yeah. putting this out for consultation at the moment. But you can see yeah, it's very so different from saying Mataranga Māori is equal to to all other knowledges and, and you've got to give equal time to both uh, probably in most chemistry courses, there won't be, uh, I, I'd suggest, the need for, 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 for much time on, on to uh, Mataranga Māori chemistry coming into it. Uh, it will be important that all students, and this is another recommendation, there'll be a common first year course uh, where uh, if, uh, students become more aware of treaty obligations and commitments and put their future learning into context, what, you know, what it is to, to learn in a New Zealand environment. Uh, all of these courses and, and are being discussed, but I think you're seeing a different approach already to how Mataranga Māori could be introduced into courses. And I think one of my other arguments is it's going to be very different for different subjects. So I've just been talking about chemistry because I think when you get onto the human sciences, psychology, get into the humanities and, and even biological sciences, this discussion could be quite different in terms of what concepts are appropriate to bring in and, and how there will be... Uh, as I say, uh, merging or, or embedding of, of, of Mataranga Māori within those other subjects. Yeah, well, mm. well, that was interesting because that, that was going to be my next question was what's happening in the universities. So going back to the, the statement from that educational report, again, that'll be in the show notes, um, it did make this blanket statement that um, if I... Um, remember the quote, it's that Mataranga Māori uh, should have parity with, in inverted commas, Western knowledge. I think they may have used other, other knowledge systems as well. Um, and what I learned from um, Lawrence Krauss, he was very critical of blanket statements. Mm, and mm. I think that's, you know, that's a, I thought that was a very interesting point. It's just too ill-defined. If, you know, we have to, we have to, have statements which specify exactly what's going to happen where and to whom um rather than these because it, it's too nefarious you just you know it sort of it means everything and it means nothing at the same time so that's good to hear that the university is is taking a more sort of a rational approach um it's I just want to explain you you've, you've used the word treaty and again you know for my international uh, yeah, listeners, yeah. The, 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 what, what we're talking about is something called the Treaty of Waitangi, which is uh, the founding document of New Zealand. It was a treaty between the British Crown, uh, the British government of the time, the colonial power, and um, a majority, correct me if I'm wrong, but a majority but not all Maori tribes. Um, and essentially it's the... Uh, you know, the Magna Carta of New Zealand. Um, and do you want to just talk to me, you've mentioned the words principles of the treaty. 
what are those principles? Well, I, I'm, that's, that's I might not get important. this all right. I might not be the best person to, to talk yeah, about that's, that that's here. Right. That's right. Uh, a lot it's of the your... uh, you know, need for, and, and this is coming in, into New Zealand, actually, our future generation of school leavers will be much more educated in this than perhaps you and I, because it's coming into the history curriculum as a central part to learn about the treaty, the English and Maori versions and how they were different. And so what was being ceded by the Maori, uh, was it uh, complete uh, governance uh, or, or what was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, was it more for that it was governance for, for, the, for the Pākehā, the arrivals, uh, the colonisers and, and, and the Maori were, uh, should, should have their independent uh, governing structures. All of that's being, being considered as, as to what was really signed up for in that. And uh, you, you perhaps need to get a, a better expert than myself. Yeah. And to, yeah. In fact, for, for my own family history, in fact, uh, because as a Naitahu did get to sign uh, uh, the treaty, there's about seven or so of our chiefs did, but not, not, not stopping at every, every marae or every place around there. And in fact, mm. our, our big beef with uh, the colonising government was was not so much the treaty, but the the deeds, uh, the land deeds from about 1844 to 1864, where large sections of the South Island were sold uh, or to 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 the government, and reserves allocated for for Maori to stay on. Uh, so a very different history than than the land wars of the North Island, but in, in all of the then. The, things were so horribly done with that, that the reserves were so small that it really conscribed the, the, the South Island Maori to poverty. And I could speak, I could speak for the next hour just about that and how it's affected my own family history. It led, led us mm. to actually then my, my great grandfather heading to the North Island because there was nothing left in the South Island for them. So that's a terrible example yeah. of the consequences. But it, the interesting thing is for, for, for the next 50 years, they're talking about the deeds. The, the treaty hardly gets mentioned at Naitahu till later. I'm sure they're aware of it, but uh, it wasn't. Uh, they were more concerned about the deeds and now what went what was also not done properly with the deeds of settlement not only was not enough land given uh provided for, for their subsistence uh but there were promises of schools and hospitals so promises of learning and they were never fulfilled and that was part yeah. of the grievance that uh uh, uh Naitahu were, 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 were complained about so consistently for seven generations before they got redressed as part of the early treaty of waitangi uh presentations and, and, and a settlement for Naitahu. So it's it's yeah. you get different experiences around the country of of of, of what has been the big issues uh, over our history. Yes well, yes, well, I mean, there's, there's two things to acknowledge there, the tragedy of what happened mm -hmm. and um, and also that the Maori weren't essentially one people, as I understand it, they, they were tribes. So it's, it's sort of, uh, you could imagine it's like the United States of America. You know, they're different states, they're different tribes, and and certain things happen to different, uh, you know, not all the same thing happened to this, um, all tribes in the same way. Hmm. And, and again, you know, I think that, you know, we all have to be aware, you know, I think history is really fundamental to, to, to one's future. And we want to right the wrongs of the past as much as we can. Are there limits to that? I mean, we're sort of getting off topic, but, but it's, it's interesting. Are there, are there limits to that? Well, this, this is a, a big question. For Naitahu, of course, you go back to the original treaty settlement of around 170 million, which was part of a, a capped $1, $1 billion uh, allocation. And uh, so, but and it was a difficult decision for Tippany O'Regan and others to say, well, will we accept this? given that the real value of what was lost was perhaps a hundred times or more than that and real lost uh, but it, it provide they, they did accept it and got on with it Naitaha have been extremely uh, productive with their and I'm so proud of what they've done uh, with with their industries with uh, invigorating uh, the Marae building Marae uh, getting people involved getting more people signing back up and registered I'd always been in our family had always been registered from very early times uh, right back from my great grandmother and so forth. Uh, the, we, we were always part of the tribe from from that point of view, but uh, yeah, and they've done so much in so many other areas. And if I take one chemistry example, since two thousand and three, Naitahu have had a has no committee, a hazardous substances and new organisms committee. Uh, so this is important in New Zealand whenever 
uh, chemicals are introduced into into use within New Zealand or new organisms, particularly genetically modified. We have an environmental protection authority which evaluates whether they should be accepted. Well, Nata have been very active for the last eighteen years in making submissions on on these topics, on on which chemicals should we be using and and which are better than the ones we currently use, and and that's been great. And they've been ahead of the pack in that and pro providing a Maori perspective. How will chemis chemicals in the environment? How will new organisms affect? Uh, the environment in, in in the South Island, the waterways, the uh, uh, and uh, the, the 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 biosphere, the the animals and plants that live there. What are the consequences? And they will oppose some chemicals being introduced and 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 accept others uh, as as and have have made very knowledgeable submissions. I think they're very well respected. So, again, from a chemistry point of view, I'm so proud of what Naitahu have done in that sphere. Hmm. Now, going back to the you know the discussion about the incorporation of Mataranga Māori in Auckland University. We live in a multicultural environment. I imagine you teach. You know, when you walk into the class, you're looking at the United Nations. Would that be correct? Oh, very much. My own research group reflects that. Yes, yes, yes. Very, yes, very multicultural yes. environment. Yes, and what I'm interested in, in knowing is that. How does they, um, let's say, if, if if I'm an an Indian immigrant, you know, I moved here when I was ten, but I'm I'm a I'm an Indian Kiwi. Um, how does how does all that fit with my knowledge systems as an Indian? I'm just I'm just using that as a yeah, random yeah. example. And, and could Indian take, could take, you could be you know Muslim, you know, you could be from Iraq or wherever, mm, mm. but um, so we've got, it's not a sort of a bipolar world in terms of Western Māori. It is a multipolar world in terms of all sorts of uh, belief systems. Very so, true. And, so, and, and uh, you know, I respect all, you know, I have people from different faiths and uh, backgrounds and worldviews who are in the lab. We all work on on chemicals in the same same way once we're in the lab and so forth. So um, there's there's some commonality that that uh, we meet over over research questions in chemistry and 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 so forth. But uh, yeah, you, you, I mean that's that's such an appealing thing about New Zealand how diverse it's become and and the input that the valuable input that our uh, new immigrants have have, have made. Uh, and, and Auckland's a great example of that. So they're very welcome and they bring lots of interesting perspectives and. If, if, if you think about, uh, I'm particularly aware of, uh, say, the Asian perspectives and my colleague from biological science, Anthony Paul, having re recently published an article in the conversation about how so many of these concepts like Maori were found in his Japanese uh, ancestry and giving examples of how Japan history has, has, has dealt with. Uh, their own spiritual and traditional ideas, meeting modern, uh, you know, becoming part of modern science and modern medicine. Uh, and it is a very interesting perspective that he, that he provides. So, yeah, we have these yeah, diverse, diverse ranges. In another sense, though, many of us, uh, if I include myself, thinking of my Irish and English ancestry, we're relative newcomers still. And so we respect that there are Indigenous people here who uh, were here first. And uh, um, uh, this is the only place where you'll find the, the Maori culture. And it needs to be, uh, you know, Proper places given for it to thrive, uh, and, uh, by, and and the question is how our university should do that, as opposed to some of the other Wangana, the teaching facilities for Maori. And I think there, there will be a place for uh, Maori as Maori to, to learn more, as as there are courses and opportunities already. I think we'll see more of that, and great, um, alongside welcoming in uh, our, our diverse range of students. Who, who need to learn about the New Zealand context if they're just coming in for their degree for the first time, they haven't been through our schooling system. The, this, this foundational course will offer the opportunity to get a common under, appreciation of where they are now living and, and studying. So I'm very supportive of, of a lot of those, but so I'm, I'm, I'm waddling around a bit uh, uh, over the place, but, uh, you know, because uh, there's lots of issues here. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, we do live in a multicultural society as well as living in New Zealand, which has a unique history and and uh, uh, that's reflected in the treaty and uh, and what's what's happened over the last two hundred years. Hmm. Right. I was recently talking to 
uh, someone who worked a lecturer at the university and I, I didn't bring up uh, what I was doing on the podcast at all but she it sort of came out of nowhere she was saying they're now um, saying prayers at the beginnings of meetings at the university um, Maori prayers and she said even Tongan prayers in, in one particular case um, I was rather surprised because I, I, I thought the whole premise of our society was that there was a separation between church and state or between religion and state and the university is a, a state, uh, you know, a, a derivative of the state. Uh, is, is, that, is that a one-off or is that something that's growing or what's your experience with that? Well, it's, well, it's probably growing and I think uh, rather than see them so much as prayers and, and implying a distinct religious belief, they're often the karakia are uh, an opening plea uh, that, 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 that the meeting will be uh, productive uh, and it'll be done in a good spirit between the people. So, you know, um, perhaps we should, you know, in some way we, we need this a little bit more, a pause before or a pause after a meeting uh, to, to just put it in context, a time for reflection. So I, I won't understand uh, uh, what's being said uh, when, that, when that is done. Uh, but um, I'll listen respectfully and often just then mulling over, okay, how will I contribute to this meeting? Uh, what spirit is it being undertaken in? And, and, and uh, so I take it in, the, in, in, in that regard, yeah. So it's, it's, it's sort of bringing a, a, a ritual into that. Yeah, so, so, so some ritual is, no. and, and rituals can be fine. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in a way, my criticism of, of secular society is that we've lost a lot of our rituals. Right, um, right. So, yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, so in your teaching at the university, well, actually, so I'll go, go backtrack, actually. You gave that talk in February to, to, um, to your university colleagues. What was, was there a response, positive, negative, were there, were there uh, criticisms, concerns from people, or mm, mm. was there lots of agreement with what you were saying? Yes, yeah, so I had about 80 people on, 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 on the uh, uh, Zoom uh, lecture seminar, and um, as I say, we'd invited our own School of Chemical Sciences. It was a bit orientated to the, to the discussions we need to have, and it also invited the Institute of Chemistry people, so mainly chemists, but with some other welcome visitors as well. Um, uh, afterwards, uh, so, so uh, our own chemist didn't didn't have many questions just immediately afterwards. But I was uh, I received a flood of emails saying, "Look, thanks for having this opportunity. I'm, I'm really interested. I sort of feel I, I don't know enough to be able to contribute, and I'm still thinking it through." Uh, so, so I did I didn't have anyone email to say specifically, "Look, I really disagree on, with you on this or that," which I'd have welcomed because I want to learn. Mm -hmm. and, and as I say, even since then, I've started to. Uh, change my views a little bit, not perhaps too greatly, and th and that's what it should be about. As as as, as we're having these discussions, so so generally f positive feedback and thank and people thanking for having the opportunity uh, to do that. Lots of people in expression also their their thoughts around the issue, and, and we're able to have some good dialogue uh, through emails with some of those people, including from other departments in our university, again who are looking for an opportunity to have these discussions. And it's just, uh, it just hasn't been possible, unfortunately, uh, in, in recent months to do so. And I hope we're, we're, we're going to see that, those opportunities in the future. Right. So why, why do you say it hasn't been possible? Well, from, I think there's been the delays. Practice. Yeah, I think with, with all the controversy over the letter, both the Royal Society and the university committed last year to having seminars or workshops on this. Uh, I think the university is still planning to do so later in the year rather than the early yeah. stages of the year. Also, COVID was, was, was another factor as, as to when that could be right. organised. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there, so there's no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm feeling reassured. Um, there's no, um, uh, no one saying to you, you shouldn't be talking about this. No, 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 no one ever said that. And uh, yeah, right. yeah. And, uh, and uh, is, there, is there support from the administration for some, you know, for these conversations? Unsure. I, ne I never really ask anyone's permission <laughs> to, to, to do the seminar. We just have a seminar series, so I, I put this up for yeah. uh, people can come along and listen. Um, uh, I would hope that uh, we will see more 
opportunities uh, in the future. So uh, yeah, I keep uh, making right. that point to my heads of school and things to say, yeah. okay, let's let's right. have more of this in, in other departments as well. I've been asked to speak in some other departments, but I've, I've said, look, look, uh, let's have some of their own people speak as well, and I'd be keen to join in things. So we'll see if that develops in the future. Yeah, that's great. So to finish, what do you think should happen with regard to the New Zealand curriculum? And you know, in, in science, and you know, more broad, sorry, more broadly, science, but in particular, your field in chemistry. Look, I think there's some good, good intentions and good things happening there within the curriculum. I think just to catch your breath a bit and and have a look at uh, some of the content here. As I say, when you've got a government principle of equal status for Mataranga Māori, and, and and just about all subjects should have. Uh, an equal quantity of that, then that puts the pressure on a subject like chemistry. You've got to put something in, and something like Maori gets inserted. Uh, I wonder whether when it perhaps should have been left out uh, from from that. And uh, so, so I'm hoping, and, and I'll keep advocating for this for some revision of those those principles there. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I'm not sure, quite sure how the Ministry of Education will work in these these regards. I think they're now starting to do the next two levels of courses, the, state, the second and third year, year of NCA, so the final two years of high school. And uh, I'll, I'll be watching out for, for more of what comes into the curriculum and, and make some submissions about those. I, I didn't didn't pick up on it early enough to make submissions on the earlier statements. Uh, we, we, we all get so busy, we don't always see what's happening until until uh, until this issue comes up. The listener letter, in fact, made us all aware that things were happening. Uh, and, and jolted us out of our busy lives to say, okay, let's 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 take an interest in this. So I'm thankful for the yeah. letter writers for, for that. And for all the people who have contributed uh, in the debate, I've been following it as, and, uh, as, as, as closely. A lot of overseas commentators have taken an interest. So I found all of their ideas well worth considering uh, on both sides of the argument uh, in recent months. And uh, hopefully, as I say, locally in New Zealand, uh, we can have more discussion. That would be my hope. Yeah. Well, just going back to that point, you know, you're saying that the government is committed to parity uh, between Māori knowledge and you know, so-called Western knowledge. Um, you know, as they say, the law is a blunt instrument. What What's required is a, is a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer. Um, because there's just, you know, as, as you pointed out, this, in some cases, it's not applicable in certain fields. Um, and what's very encouraging about what you're saying is, is it seems like the, the shape of this dialogue um, is improving, which is part of the reason I started the, you know, started doing this discussion on this matter. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really good. I great. hope it is. You're, you're hearing my views here and that, and I'm not necessarily uh, hearing, hearing everything else, what people are saying. Um, so, you know, the, the, the views may be more diverse, but that's, that's, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, optimistic about where it'll go from here great well that's a that's a beautiful place to, to finish the conversation <laughs> so just want to say thank you very much for coming on board and uh it's been a really interesting discussion and really appreciate uh how well you articulate the the whole subject thank, thank you michael thank you for, for 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 taking the time to have these podcasts so, so i think i've really enjoyed it today and and uh I'd welcome any feedback that people have. Uh, you know, I'd like to learn new views and uh, continue to learn about this area further. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's what dialogue is all about. Mm -hmm. so it's a wonderful thing.